Hello. In this section, we're going to talk about what a hydraulic model is. Go over some of the basic principles of hydraulic modeling, especially with regard to water distribution systems. What does a model do? Well, what the hydraulic model does is take in the information such as the properties of the piping network, the demands or loads on the pipes that you have to meet, and the way the system's operated. It will calculate for you basically the flows in the pipes, the pressures, and any junctions between the pipes, the hydraulic grade of the pipes, water quality if you are making a water quality run, and in some cases it will provide you with costing information. So essentially, you give it a description and it will give you what's going on underground inside the pipes. So what are the components that make up the model? Well, first of all, you have to get the input data into the model. And typical models today contain some type of a graphical user interface that makes the data entry fairly easy, whether you're entering the data manually or whether you're importing it from some external source, such as a CAD drawing or a geographical information system. Okay, and the data is generally stored now within model files, which we'll call a database. It could be one file, it could be multiple files. And what you do with that is you solve equations. It sets up the equations that describe what's going on inside that piping network and puts those results back in a file for you to use. And then we provide ways to look at the results and see what is happening in the water distribution system. It's a pretty simple process. You put in the input, we keep it saved for you. You solve the equations that describe what's going on and look at the results. So how does a model represent a water distribution system? Because there are many components to a distribution system. Well, the first type of components we'll call links. These are essentially the pipes in your system. Along any pipe, the equations are solved based on a constant flow from one to the other. And what is calculated is the change in head, the change in hydraulic grade line along the pipe. Another type of element within a water distribution system what we'll call nodes. These are point features. These could be water users, they could be tanks, they could be junctions of pipes, isolation valves. At node elements, you don't know what the flow is because there's multiple pipes going into the junction, so it's not really a single flow. What you're doing here is calculating the conservation of flow, that is that the mass in equals mass out at these places. And then we have some special elements that aren't exactly links and aren't exactly nodes. These would be things like pumps and control valves. These are point locations, so they behave in that way like a node, but they have some type of change in head, either energy is added or removed from the system at these places. And so these are uh, additional elements in addition to the pure links and node elements. So what kind of equations are solved? I said you know, that what the models do are solve systems of equations that describe what's going on. Well, they're really just two kinds of equations. The first one is the continuity principle. It says mass is conserved. Any point in the system, the mass of water going into that point equals the mass going out. The sum of those QI terms that you see represent the pipes going into a point on the system. U would be the water that gets used up at that point in the system water consumers. And in steady conditions, that's it. That's equal to zero. The sum of the flow in equals the sum of the flow out. When you have tanks in under steady conditions, you also have to account for the change in the water stored in the tank. So that's what those ADHDT terms are. They're accounting for the fact that the sum of the inflows and the water use also can have water stored. Now the energy principle in some ways is even simpler. It says that at the end of a pipe, the energy you have is equal to the energy at the start of the pipe minus any head loss, that is minus any energy that was used up to move the water. We can illustrate that with this picture. So you start off with water in a tank, and as the water moves from point A to point B to point C, it uses up energy. There's friction along the pipes. And this results in a lowering of head or hydraulic grade line along the pipe. And that slope of that line is related to the flow rate and velocity. The faster the water moves, the steeper the, the loss of energy is. And so what we spend a lot of our time in these calculations is calculating the head loss along any pipe in the system. So the energy principle is a little more complicated than the continuity principle where mass of water is mass of water. In terms of energy, you can have different forms of energy. And there are three main forms we are concerned about in 
hydraulics, that is, the energy could be in the form of pressure, it could be in the form of kinetic energy called velocity head, or it could be just the elevation where that water is in the Earth's gravitational field. The higher up the water is, the more energy it has. Now generally for our hydraulic model calculations, we could get by with ignoring the velocity head because that's usually orders of magnitude smaller than the pressure and elevation effects, though in some instances we have to include it as well. These are the forms of energy, so we're generally concerned about the pressure and the elevation. As water goes uphill, the pressure drops, basically. So the other thing we said was we spent a lot of time doing head loss calculations. Head loss refers to the amount of energy you use up along a pipe. Now the problem here is that we're dealing in water distribution systems and sewer systems and irrigation systems, fire flow systems, generally with turbulent flow in pipes. And there's not a single theoretically correct equation for flow head loss in pipes because turbulent flow is just very difficult to calculate head loss for. So what's evolved are a series of different equations, all of which have their own strengths and weaknesses. And the three most commonly used ones you'll find in the industry are the darcy Weisbeck equation, the Hayes and Williams equation, and Manning's equation. Now, which one is right? Well, they're all right. It's a matter of which one you feel the most comfortable with or is most appropriate for your problem. The Darcy Weisbeck equation is probably the most theoretically correct, and it's good for all fluids. It uses a friction factor, F, to represent the roughness of the pipe overall. Historically, it's been more difficult to calculate this F because it's not a nice, neat constant. And so it has not been used as widely in the U.S. in the water industry and wastewater industry as some of the other equations. Hayes-Williams equation is a water equation, which means it's water and wastewater. People represent the carrying capacity of this by a factor called C, and, and we have a pretty good feel for C values, a lot better than we do for Fs. It's best, though, for smooth flow, and it's widely used in the U.S. and many places around the world. Manning's equation is another one that's a water or wastewater equation, and we also represent in this case the roughness of the pipe by a value called N. It's generally most applicable for rough flow. It's used in the U.S. and North America more so for sewer applications than water applications. So we solve these equations, which involve one continuity equation for each node and one energy equation either around each loop or between each pair of pipes. And this energy equation includes the head loss from pipes or the head gain or valve or loss at pumps and valves. So thinking about this, it sounds simple if you have one loop with a couple of pipes, but real water systems are made up of thousands and tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of pipes, which means that you have a very large system of equations, and these equations also are nonlinear, which is a problem when you're solving large systems of equations. So what you need to rely on are numerical solvers that have been developed and are commercially available, because solving these things manually for 100,000 pipes and junctions becomes essentially impossible. But these computer programs can do this in a very short period of time very reliably. So what happens when you start a steady single run, basically a snapshot of the system, is that the model gets the data you've entered from the database. It sets up the system of equations. We, we have n equations with n unknowns, where n depends on the complexity of your system, and essentially guesses at a solution. Sounds pretty simple. You just guess the solution that we solve and see if the values for head and flow came out right, whether those equations balance. And the first time through, they usually don't. And we have these powerful algorithms which will then adjust the head and flow rates to give you a better estimate. And so we go through this iterative solution, hopefully only a couple of times before we reach a criteria where we say, that's, that's good, that's close enough, we've solved this system of equations. And then from knowing that the head at junction nodes and the flow in each pipe, so you calculate secondary results such as the velocity in the pipes, the pressure at junctions, and make these results available to the user. So that's the most fundamental kind of solution you could have in a hydraulic network. But that's not just the only kind of run. So that just described the steady state run. And the steady state is really not exactly the name. Water systems are never totally steady. So the water model that is called a steady state run is really not so much a picture of a stationary object, but rather a snapshot of a moving object as the system is changing over time. There are other types of solutions, though. Once you can solve these systems of equations, you can do so much more with them. Some of the things we can do are extended period simulations, which look at how the system changes over time, how pumps come on and off and water levels and tanks change. 
With that and some water quality information, we can track water quality through a distribution system. We can also do fire flow analysis, where we essentially move fires throughout the system and seeing which areas can support adequate fire flows. Another kind of analysis we have is optimization, where instead of solving for flows and pressures, we use that and iterate around that with these optimization algorithms to solve for calibration parameters or pipe sizes. We can analyze flushing of water distribution systems to clean out pipes and improve quality. We can look at criticality, looking at what happens when individual elements or combinations of elements fail in the system and how the system behaves in those cases. We can look at pipe renewal, combining results like criticality and capacity during fire flows with pipe maintenance history to identify critical links in the system. And we can do things like identifying pressure zones, seeing how the system is broken up in the pressure zones and maybe how it should be broken up in the pressure zones. Once you can solve these systems and equations, there's a lot of different things you can do with the model. You can basically see into the ground and see what's happening inside of pipes using these simulation models. So in summary, what does the model do for you? Well, you give it the system properties, and it gives you the flows and pressures and hydraulic grades and water quality that you're interested in. OK, so that concludes this lecture, and hope you enjoyed it, and stick around for some others.